Hey everyone, how's it going? We're gonna uh, do some more with um, this YB moral question and our discussion of morality using um, the Williams piece that, that we read. So yesterday we were having um, just kind of general discussion. Um, I was asking people to share what their motivations and also their reasons, their justifying reasons are for integrating moral considerations as a part of, our, of, of decision making and deciding what to do, what choices to make. Um, so <clears throat> we're going to continue that, that kind of discussion. There's a lot of aspects of uh, that, that uh, this territory of debate that we're not going to get into. Um, some of, uh, I've alluded to before about how taking like an introduction to ethical theory I think is just a fantastic thing to do. Um, and a lot of it has to do with those why questions of where where does the evidence or authority come from for morality? Like, what what creates the the binding sanction of like wh why ought we to respect this stuff? And there's some of that that we're not going to get into, but we're going to do the kind of um, bigger picture things that go on sort of in the background of that. Um, I I think of this whole question, the why be moral question, as like a gateway issue. It's one of these questions we ask in philosophy that, depending on how we answer it, either a whole territory opens up for debate or it's just kind of all shut down. Like, if there's no reason to be moral, then asking the question, what is moral, is, like, largely irrelevant, right? Uh, what point is it to understand what morality is if you're not planning on having that inform your action in any kind of way, right? Uh, if there's no point to it. So, um, in a similar fashion... Williams is interested in discussing this kind of option of what if we said no? What if we had a negative answer to that question? What if we lived um, an amoral lifestyle? What if we were to become amoral people, to be a person who lives that, that kind of life? So that's what we'll be getting into today. Um, I did have a little uh, business thing I wanted to talk about first, namely um, with the response papers. Um, there are some response papers I'm missing. Um, that haven't been turned in. So if you have been waiting to see uh, your peer review of your outline and haven't received it yet, that might be because I don't have it. Um, but if you wanted to double check with me, if you're still waiting on it, um, if you wanted to check and be like, hey, just wanted to make sure, is mine not in yet? Or maybe did you make a mistake, Tim? <laughs> it's very possible for me to make mistakes. Um, I can double check that and confirm it for you if you're if you're wondering about that. Um, I don't think I've made any mistakes, but you know, never hurts to ask. If you want to check in and be very happy to, to look that up for you. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, over the next week and a half, you're going to be putting together your uh, final draft. And I just, I'm going to advertise like every day this week. If you want to talk more about your paper, I'd, I'd really like to do that. Um, and probably sooner is better than later um, in terms of checking in about that. Um, but if, even if it's last minute next week, and as long as I got time, I'm, I'm happy to share it with you. And um, and work on some stuff together, but I'm I'm available. Um, did anyone in in the chat who's here today? Uh, do you have any kind of check-in questions before we kind of get rolling with today? Um, anything you're wondering about end of end of quarter stuff? How's everyone doing? I'm gonna check in about that. I think almost every day too. Pretty good. Okay. Maybe another thing I'll, I'll ask here to get us started. Um, so yesterday's discussion was a, a, a little thin in terms of uh, how many people were, were jumping in and, and sharing their views about things. Um, does any Did anyone have anything left over that they'd like to share that, that's kind of in the spirit on the topic of, of the kind of class discussion we were trying to have yesterday? Anyone have something they, they want to throw into the mix? Um, maybe we didn't have time for or thought of later? Or kind of a follow-up on where the conversation went yesterday by the end of it? I'm not seeing anything. So maybe that means the answer is no. Um, I'm going to give just a little bit more time to see if anyone wants to to drop something in.
So Christian asks, where did the conversation end yesterday? And I actually don't remember. <laughs> um, I know I know we got into um, a lot of stuff. Of, I, I've started opening up a little bit more and, and showing, throwing my two cents into the mix a little bit on this question of why be moral. I remember I talked a little bit about um, the... Uh, challenges of giving an answer to the question of why be moral that doesn't presuppose um, moral values. Uh, it can be almost like a circular or question begging answer to the question. I know I talked a little bit about that. Um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I've, I've, there's been a lot, lot going on. I've been had lots of phone calls with students over the last couple days, and um, so I, I think it, it happened and then it kind of. Whoop, went out of my I'm usually pretty good at remembering things like that but I not not today unfortunately were you around toward the end Christian I was talking with some people kinda after class got out you know after we finished up officially um, but I can't remember maybe maybe you'd be able to help jog my memory you had to take off for another class, yeah. Okay. I mean, I still want to kind of invite people to share um, as much as possible. Uh, I I can lecture and will lecture today, <laughs> um, but the more that we can have this be dynamic, uh, I think that makes the class better. Um, so last chance. Anyone want to? say anything, make any contributions to that discussion, why be moral that we were having yesterday, anyone have any questions following up on what we talked about there, um, or anything else about the class and the end of quarter, any kind of check-in stuff. You can even just say no. <laughs> no is preferable to silence. Nope, nope. Nope. Okay. All right. All right. Looking forward to the reading. Okay. Cool. Me too. Okay. All right. Well, I will just uh, I'll just get started on this then. And I, I actually before we get to the main conversation, I included the the preface to this book for you because I think um, you know Williams is writing this for undergraduates. This is supposed to be part of like an introduction to ethics. Uh, he wrote this small little chat book thing, um, and I, I like some of the things that he he says in terms of framing getting into this whole game, like uh, the game of critically thinking about um, moral values and principles and moral living and what that's all about. Williams, as you know from, this is the same Williams we were talking about with End of Explanation, the Nagel-Williams discussion. So Williams is a subjectivist, and he, um, he he's a, well, we'll see by the end of the story. He, there's some things about how he approaches morality that are maybe a little less than industry standard, um, and, and a little bit uh, reflective of a lot of the ambiguities that are present. But just like how uh, Williams' version of subjectivism didn't keep him from agreeing with Nagel about objective moral claims and the need to make that sort of thing. He, that is still his position here, too, that he thinks there is some objectivity around moral living. It might just be a little different than how philosophers have traditionally, or many times, like, traditional is hard for morality, because it's been huge debates about it, lots of diversity of opinion throughout the entire recorded history of humanity um, thinking about these things. But there is a very a common kind of um, through line that sees it as, as being connected with rationality. And Williams has an interesting twist on that on that formula. But we'll, that's getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. I like how he, he does some of the comments. I don't agree with everything he says in this preface, but uh, especially about the um, less than optimism that he has about moral theorizing. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But I like the way that he approaches just facing off against the problem. This is kind of like the advice I gave about uh, your papers, that like um, when I was saying uh, try to respect the basis of the controversy or the question before getting too preoccupied in rationalizing your preferred answer or proposal. Um, you want to make sure, I mean, you want to do that too. You want to 
have a thesis and defend it with argument and do all that good stuff. But making sure that you're kind of honoring, that your answer honors the perplexity of the problem that you're addressing is really important for doing good work. And I think that's, that's part of what Williams is sensitive to here. His first line is about how ethics should be considered hazardous business, like writing on ethical matters should be considered a hazardous business. Um, and what he's really saying there is just that this should be approached with care and um, like diligence and, and um, like a responsible accountability um, to, to do one's due diligence, to not be negligent in the treatment of the issue. Um, and that he and he identifies a few risks here of ways that this could kind of not go in a great way. And he complains about contemporary moral philosophy a little bit here too, uh, or at least certain aspects of it, uh, certain ways in which people go about doing that in contemporary times. Williams is a contemporary philosopher. He's dead now, but not not too long, not too uh, cold in the cold in the grave. Um, when did he die? Maybe 10 years ago, something like that. But he's still, I mean, he, relatively recently from uh, the philosophy scale of history kind of thing. Um, but he, so what are these sort of concerns that he says? Well, you know, writing about anything is difficult. And writing about a difficult subject matter like ethics is, you know, that's also difficult. But he says there's two special things that are going on when you're trying to do moral philosophy. One, he says... Uh, there's a risk that you become more exposed. <laughs> yeah, like if you've got personal issues or flaws or problems or something like that, they're going to come out if you open up your mouth and start sharing your ethical perspectives on things. Um, writing about ethics is much more intimate and personal than writing on other philosophical issues. And, I, and I've kind of talked about this before, um, about how if I write about... The philosophy of time like I've got a theory about philosophy of time and I, I put it out there I publish a book or something and people criticize it you know it's like well I'm you know I'm trying to, uh, I, I, well criticism is good but but also if, if I'm shown to have be making mistakes in my thinking about time I mean that, that might bother me a little bit but it's not gonna kind of that criticism doesn't cut as deeply or, or get as close to me as if I'm writing on moral matters. When I'm when I'm sharing what I think is meaning the meaning of life is all about or what is happiness or what is good, what's valuable in this world, how I ought to act, what I think justice is, I'm really bearing my soul. I mean, our ethical views are intimately connected with our sense of our own identities, with um, the most sort of like intimate thoughts that we have. Um, Oh, it's ki it's kicking you off? Ah, oh, dang! I'm sorry, Nathan. Um, we got the internet fixed here, so I think it's it's. How is everyone else in the chat? Is it coming through pretty reliably? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, Nate, that this isn't working for you. You're doing fine tech-wise. You're not doing okay in other ways, Michael. <laughs> Okay, all right. If there's any questions, if, if I'm losing anybody, let, please let me know. Um, if, if something about the framing of this. Um, but okay, so if I, if I share my moral views, uh, and I'm doing this really sincerely, then I'm going to expose myself much more fully and intimately um, than, you know, I'm not going to, there's very little me left to hide <laughs> if I put that out there. Um, it's a much, it's a much more personal thing. So that's one danger. He's like, this is one reason to take writing on moral matters kind of like, be watching yourself. You don't know? like this is this is something to take seriously, and carefully. But the second one I think is even more compelling. He says, one runs the risk if one is taken seriously of misleading people on matters of importance. So what we think about morality is not just some kind of curiosity or you know, like, what what do I think of Star Wars or something? Like, who cares, right? If you like something, you don't like something, it doesn't matter so much. Or or even something about the philosophy of time. Like, it's interesting, we're curious about that. There's, we have questions we want answers for about how that works. But if I'm wrong about the philosophy of time, and, you know, I'm able to make it sound good, you know, I'm 
able to intelligently argue for it. I'm wrong, but I convince people I'm right. Um, there's not a lot of harm that happens there. But if I've got the wrong sense of morality, and I make the case for it, and people are convinced by my argumentative efforts, then I've just kind of spread even more problems. Because not only if I have the wrong moral views, and then I act on those moral views, that I'm now acting wrongly, like the risk of harm and injustice is present, but if I'm able to convince other people of the mistake, the mistaken view that I have, um, then they're going to spread more Im immorality, basically. Um, so that's a that's kind of the stakes are kind of high on that. Um, it, it's kind of it doesn't. I don't think Williams is saying this is why we shouldn't have these conversations. I, I don't think he's fatalistic about this sort of danger or risk, but he's like, maybe you want to check yourself before you wreck yourself on this, right? That there, there is a risk involved. As an ethicist myself, as, as this is my area of specialization, this is something I'm intimately familiar with, this kind of fear. Um, it's kind of like the fear of, uh, um, or the anxiety you might have if a friend comes to you with like some big problem that they're they're wrestling with um, maybe some like really sticky stuff with their family or um, with abuse at the workplace or um, or depression and despair or something like this and they're looking to you for advice if you've ever felt if you've ever been in that situation and you're like I don't know if I want to give advice because what if I give the wrong advice and they act on it right they, you're you sort of recognize how if you offer a perspective and they're convinced by it and it's the wrong one then you've just led them into error right and that wouldn't be good you know we can just like we can talk about truth without necessarily like we could be truth seekers without necessarily knowing that or thinking that we know what the truth is so just believe that there is an objective answer out there you can definitely think that way about morality and that your commitment to morality works in a similar fashion that what I care about is not what I think is right. I care about what's actually right. And I think that this is what's right, so that's why I respect this, my belief or my theory. But I only want to respect it if it's what's actually right. If it turns out to be wrong, then I'm like, I don't, I don't want to act that way. If I'm, if I'm making a mistake, I don't want to do that. Um, maybe you've heard the kind of like somewhat insincere apology about like, if I offended you, then I'm sorry. This is kind of like not a real apology. But you can imagine a, a more sincere way in which something kind of similar to that could happen. Like, I'm giving you my best, most sincere effort at being good, right? Of <laughs> doing what's right. And if I'm making a mistake, because people are fallible, and we make mistakes, you know, we can't, we're not going to presume that we've got all the answers about this. And if we're making a mistake, we can even if we don't know what that mistake is, we can still have a commitment to not wanting to make those mistakes. Does this make sense, chat, what I'm talking about? Yeah? Okay? Cool. All right, so after saying all that, Williams says something that to me is almost like a joke. It's like a nice punchline. He's like, um, so these are like risks that come with the territory of doing moral philosophy. Unfortunately, most moral philosophy doesn't ever run into these risks. And why? Because it's not really doing anything meaningful. That it's addressing issues of moral theoretics, but where he says it seems like all the interesting issues are left off the table. So all the core things that, are, that we really disagree about and try to work out and figure out what should I think about this are kind of quarantined and instead we like find ways to analyze morality from afar I, I was mentioning in yesterday's class when we were going to do this discussion that um, and this has happened many times when I've uh, tried to do this discussion with students in the past where when I ask this question why be moral people start giving answers that are more like well here's how people work you know here's how other people what they're up to and either trying to like psychoanalyze them or do some like social psychology uh, or political analysis or economics uh, or something like that to like cultural analysis to explain why humans work the way that they do with morality but they're not you're not necessarily personally getting into that discussion you're kind of poking at the question with a 10-foot pole um, hanging back Right? And just being like, well, here's what other people are doing, right? But you're not like jumping into it. 
and taking a stand about like, well, when I'm thinking about this for myself, this is what I'm thinking about. This is what's informing my decision. Doing that kind of personal vulnerability that, that, uh, that Williams is talking about comes with the territory of doing substantive ethics. There's also all this like weird logic stuff that happens and even some philosophy of language. I, I was mentioning with Wittgenstein lecture how there was a, a sort of a fad um, or like a movement in philosophy to try to solve philosophical problems by doing a linguistic analysis, like a real deep breakdown of like, what do we mean by this word? That happened with ethics in the early 20th century too. So you had all these philosophers being like, what do we mean when we say something is moral or immoral? What do we mean by saying something is good versus something is bad? Like just, let's just analyze how people use those words and then that's somehow going to give us some guidance about what we should think is good and bad or right and wrong. Um, I don't think, pers personally, I don't think that that uh, direction of analysis is able to fulfill the ambitions that people had for it. I don't think it solves these moral questions. Um, I think it, it may inform it in terms of us thinking and speaking clearly. Um, but in terms of deciding the controversies, I'm not sure it really pre presents a whole lot of evidence for that. And definitely moral philosophy has moved on from that kind of uh, fad. Um, but there's there's still some meta-ethical debates that kind of get into some linguistic stuff, or that's trying to unpack the, the language in which we express moral views. But anyway, um, there is a way in which sometimes moral philosophy approaches things too formally and doesn't get into the real messy things. But I also want to report, I, I, didn't, I don't want you to get the wrong impression from Williams here. William, I think Williams has a point with some of the philosophy that's done, but a lot of the moral philosophy from history doesn't really fit this category. Um, I mean, Williams remarks at one point, like, the number of substantive books on the topic, he's like, I can count on one hand, or some metaphor kind of like that. And I don't think that that's quite true. <laughs> At least, it's not true in, in my estimation, um, with my uh, education in moral philosophy. There's a ton of philosophical works on moral matters that really get into all the substantive, nitty-gritty, messy-in-the-mud stuff that Williams is saying, this is what we need to be spending time on. One thing I do appreciate about Williams, though, is he says... He's got this kind of anti-theory thing going on, too, which is also probably why he finds more of the history of moral philosophy not as impressive <laughs> or valuable in his in his view. But he does say, and I disagree with him about that, more on that in a second, but um, he does say that the first responsibility of, of someone who wants to work in ethics or do some serious inquiry into ethics is to the moral phenomenon themselves. And I agree with him about that, that it's like, uh, it can't just be this academic or scholastic, detached from reality type of theory. The theory needs to capture the stuff that's present where we're at. And where we're at with morality is we got life decisions to make. What should inform that? I mean, ethics and morality is all about how ought we to act. What, it, what is right action? What's wrong action? How should we go about decision making? What's the proper way to do this and what's the improper way to do this? Um, and it even, I mean, it's willing to even presuppose that assumption that there is a right way to do it. That's part of what ethics gets into too. Um, Bernadette says, so it's situational. Ethics is situational? Is that what you're, or what Williams is saying about this? The acknowledgement of moral phenomenon themselves? Yeah, yeah, okay. This is a great, great, um, thank you for that. Uh, this is going to provoke me to, to go in a good direction here, I think. So, when we ask, um, like this happens all the time in my ethics classes that I teach. I'm like, ask students, like, what do you think? Do you think this is right or wrong? And almost every time, the inevitable response here is, it depends. And I'm like, okay, that's a, that's a fair answer. It's, uh, right now, it's not a very substantive one, but you can make it into one as long as you say, as you answer the question, depends on what. So talking about objectivity and moral matters doesn't mean saying these actions are always wrong or always right or always permissible or versus impermissible. Um, but it, it can be contingent. It can be conditional. The question is, where is that line drawn? And wherever that line is drawn, that's your answer about the object, that's your objective, your attempt at the, to define the objectivity of, of this moral matter. 
I, I describe the, to my ethics students like there's like this moral landscape and when we design a moral theory it's like drawing a map to try to represent that landscape a, as it actually exists and it's not like landscapes are just like this or just like this there can be you know peaks and valleys there can be mountains and and you know uh, crevasses you know so where where does that happen where where do things go from being permissible to being impermissible for example um, your theory would be to draw a line on that and the fact that it applies to different cases in different ways doesn't mean it's not objective and doesn't mean that it's not universal either because the rule that you're setting up the like the where those boundary conditions are is the universal rule that treats all the cases alike so um, I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent here, but this is fun stuff about ethical theory. Let me give you an example to illustrate this point. Um, let's say a student wants to turn in late work. And, and let's say I'm not, I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge softy about this, but imagine I was a little stricter. Like I had a, a much more strict, like no late homework kind of policy. I might still put some conditions in there, like cases under which I would accept late work. So imagine a student comes up to me after class and is like, hey, Tim, you know about my situation. Okay, if I turn this thing that was due today in tomorrow. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. And then another student overhears that and is like, hey, uh, so can I do that too? And I'm like, nope, nope, not going to accept that from you. They might be like, but but you just said that they they could do it. Why, why can't I do it? Is this a double standard? Are you being a hypocrite? What's going on here? Right? I'm treating the two cases in different ways. Following so far? Making sense? The risk of like having a double standard or hypocrisy here? I'm treating people in different ways, right? Am I actually treating them in different ways, though, in an arbitrary way? Well, not necessarily. What if I set up some conditions to my late homework policy? But I'm like, well, if you're under situations X, Y, or Z, then I'll accept late work, otherwise not. So maybe one student is in one of those X, Y, or Z cases, and so they qualify under the rule, and the other student does not qualify because they're not in one of those cases. Now, I could still be hypocritical with that rule if I don't play with it consistently with all of my students. But as long as I'm using it consistently, then I can't be accused of having a double standard here. Now, my rule could still be a bad rule, but at least I wouldn't be in danger of contradicting my own judgments or doing something arbitrarily. Or I, I have one rule, and I universally apply it to everybody. It's fair. Right? It's, it's, so that can happen. The universal rules of morality can have a lot of nuance to them and probably should have a lot of nuance to them. When we're thinking about a particular case of like, what should we do in this particular case, there's not just going to be one moral facet to it. There's probably a lot of different things that are of moral concern or a potential moral concern. And how to weigh all those factors against each other is part of what you want a theory to be able to do, to be able to integrate those things together and say, you know, here's, here's how the priorities break down. Like, this thing's good, but if it's between this and this other thing, then this one's more important, and here's why. Here's why there are consistent rules about how we're making those value judgments and tackling all the diverse ranges of circumstances that we might face. Is that making sense? Any, any questions about that idea? No, you, you don't think there are any questions or you don't think it makes sense? Oh, it makes sense. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. Sorry, I asked two weird questions back to back. Um, yeah, if anyone else has questions about it, let me know. Um, but just that this is like a possibility, it, and actually this is going to be important for what happens in the rest of the Williams piece too, because Williams is going to identify the idea of consistent universal judgments about what to do, like what's good and bad and right and wrong, as one of the things that sort of characterizes moral thinking as opposed to amoral thinking. Okay, That's going to be a, an important feature, but more on that in, in a little while. Um, so uh, while Williams in this preface doesn't sort of have, he's not a big fan of ethical theories. He doesn't think that uh, the, the way that philosophers have a specialized skill set, which they definitely do, uh, this kind of intellectual skill set about crafting theories uh, and evaluating theories, he's not sure whether that's the most important thing for respecting or being 
responsive to moral phenomena. I disagree with him, and I think they're incredibly helpful um, for exactly that function. But I agree with him that the, the, the goal here is that whatever is going to be our relationship with moral matters, the, the underlying goal is to be sensitive and appropriately responsive to whatever's going on with those realities, with those moral realities. And we can strongly disagree about that. Like we can have different ideas of, of what are the morally relevant features to cases and what aren't morally relevant features. Um, or about how they are, how those features should inform our choices. That could be a major thing too. Um, but uh, so little disagreement there, but also a lot of agreement between me and Williams on this. Um, I just wanted to kind of point out how theory can very much help us with respecting those things and making sure that we're not holding double standards, that we've got consistency. But kind of like a, a one final note on this. So thinking back way, 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 way back to the beginning of the class when we did personal identity, that first topic in metaphysics, and I presented the whole like analyzing A's in terms of some other B's, like giving a theory for something. And we talked about how you can use thought experiments and example cases as a way to test a theory. Because if the theory is supposed to apply, it's supposed to apply universally. And is it doing so consistently? Are there counterexamples? You know, that kind of stuff. Um, and so, hey. Um, and so uh, the same thing happens with morality, too. Like, if you offer principles, the goal is to be able to have non-arbitrary reasons for why you're acting the way that you are, that justify the action. And you have to consider all the range of cases. So setting up universal moral principles um, or universal moral theories is really not to gloss over difference or diversity of circumstances, you know, contingencies, all that. But rather, if it does that, it's a bad theory. It's got to be able to integrate those considerations. And there's a lot of different ways to do that, and that's why there's controversy in ethics. Okay. But let, let's get on to... Um, the actual main topic here that we're looking at, the, so the, the chapter I selected for you out of this book, um, the, a, the a, this discussion of the amoralist. Um, any other questions though before I, I do that? Anything else from chat? Anything people want to ask about? Just going good so far today? Yeah? Okay. Um, I could very easily get distracted here, um, so why don't I just give you the code word now? Uh, it's Pegasus. That is, I'll put it in the chat here. Pegasus. There we go. Pegasus. Okie dokie. So like I was saying at the very top of the lecture, um, this question, why be moral, is like a gate, gateway question. And if we answer yes, I should be moral, and here's why. Then a door opens up, and then we step into this wide, wide, diverse field of perspectives on what is moral, and, and what should we think is right and wrong and good and bad, and what is the meaning of life, and all these kinds of big questions about value, and we start debating them. If we answer no, though, that door is shut, and we're like, who cares what's behind that door? Um, so th there's a reason to kind of start here. In, in thinking about approaching moral philosophy or, or doing a study of, of morality. And not from a kind of scientific perspective that just boils it down to like the, the, the causal explanation of why people have the moral values they do. Uh, like when you, if you remember back from the end of explanation, like just explaining someone's moral outlook in terms of their causal biases. We're talking about a study or inquiry into what should we think about, not what do people think about, um, moral matters and what are the causes for why they have that opinion, but rather the justifying question. Why should, what should we think? What ought we to think about moral matters? What moral beliefs should we have? That's the debate that we get into in moral philosophy. So we're not, we're not like social scientists. Um, we might definitely take a lot of the product of social science as informing, as a part of the discussion, but it's not, it's, not, it's not like an analysis of morality, it's just an analysis of moral opinion. It's about the legitimacy of those options for what we could believe and which one makes, what, is, what makes the most rational defense to hold. But one option we always have to consider here is that maybe it doesn't matter. And that's what the amoralist represents. The amoralist is 
someone who gives a negative answer to the question, why should I ought to do anything? And there's some stuff about despair that Williams is getting in it as he opens up this discussion. So he's thinking about, you know, here's a, a person who is taking the stance that morality is significant. And they're like, yeah, there's a, when it comes to what I'm supposed to do, there's a lot of oughts. You know, there's a lot of things that I ought to do. But if someone is like skeptical about that and you're like, really? Is there really anything that I ought to do? Why should I do anything? Williams is like, well, one way someone could be sort of asking that question, maybe not with the tone of voice I just used, but they could be uh, saying, why should I do anything as an expression of despair or hopelessness, um, like, like depression? Um, what's the point? You know, that kind of thing. <clears throat> and, sorry, it's bus city right now. Is the bus real uh, coming over the microphone? Maybe I'll go back to doing this. Did this work pretty good before? Is this helping? It's not bad. Is it bad if I do this? No? Okay, cool. Then I, I think it's loud. Oh, maybe the buses are going to stop. Oh, yeah, well, we'll see. Sorry about that, everyone. Um... Yeah, I don't think there's any more that are coming. I kind of got a, like a rear view mirror here so I can see if they're they're coming from back there. Okay, um, sorry, I got distracted. So uh, the first way someone might be like, why should I do anything, is as this expression of despair. And um, Williams says, and we want to be really careful here about exactly what he is saying and, and make sure we distinguish from what he's not saying. But he's saying the the... the possibility of a person like this and there it's not just a possibility people do actually experience this I've experienced this I'm sure many of you have too um, maybe some more than others or maybe you but maybe you've had some secondhand cases of encountering people who have a deep despair about investing in anything in life um, and Williams his sort of uh, his take on this scenario is that that kind of person doesn't really pose a threat to the rationality of why you ought to be moral. So if we're imagining like the moralist is one figure in this discussion, a person who thinks there are moral truths and they ought to, they ought to uh, inform our choices in life, um, and they've got some reasons for that. They, they maybe have some arguments to try to back it up to. Um, and they, they want to say, this is what is rational. You, why should you be moral? Because of this stuff. Here are some reasons for it. So it's got a positive answer to that question. And then over here, you've got the opponent, the person who doesn't see the, the uh, relevance of these moral considerations and might challenge the logic of the reasons for this. The amoralist is going to be one of these people, but we can also maybe imagine someone who is just experiencing despair. And so they, that view or that type of person represents an alternative to the moralist person. And so which one should we be? You know, what person should we be? If we can make choices about this, which way should we go? And if we think that there are some reasons for being moral, um, whatever they are, um, does someone who is experiencing despair and depression um, threaten the rationality uh, of being moral? Does it threaten the legitimacy of those arguments? And William says no. He says, if reason, if you're like arguing with someone, um, trying to like, I, this would not be a good thing to do, and I don't think Williams would say so either, but if you're trying to argue with someone who's in despair and say, well, here's all the rational reasons why life has meaning and why there is good and bad and right and wrong and that you have choices to make about what to do with your, with your life, right? And choose the good over not the good, right? Um, those reasons might fall flat for such a person. Um, but Williams is going to say, um, this is not because the reasons are bad, but because the person that you're talking to is maybe in a state where they can't be responsive to those reasons. I, I'm sure you've had experiences in life where you're like, maybe in a disagreement with someone, like there's a some conflict going on with maybe a friend or a family member or a partner or something like that, and um, and you're like, man, I got a bunch of arguments I want to give to them for why I think their position is wrong and I'm right or something like that. But you're like, 
maybe this isn't the right time for an argument. Like, maybe we shouldn't try to have a philosophical debate about this right now. Maybe that's not the tool for the job. Maybe, uh, or as I, a slogan I'm always fond of saying, sometimes people don't need arguments, they need a hug. Right? Some, and that's what Williams is saying here, that this, the person who's in despair and depression doesn't need a philosophical argument. They don't need logical reasons. They need help. <laughs> right? That uh, This isn't so much about the failure of rationality as much as a person being in a position where they can entertain it. Okay, so the reasons might be good even if they fail to convince someone in a particular situation. Um, if you ask me, I kind of think he's a little right about this and a little wrong. Like I do, like I just shared some of the things I think are true that are very closely aligned with what Williams is saying. The one little caveat I would put to it is that I think sometimes the reasons do help in exploring things sort of philosophically or rationally or even just the, the word intellectually. I think that can be helpful. Um, I was thinking for a time about whether, uh, instead of getting a degree in philosophy and teaching, whether I wanted to um, be a therapist. And uh, I actually, even when I was in grad school, I got some connections with, with some other philosophers who had done this. And there, there's actually a uh, kind of a school of uh, therapeutic or psychological thought called, um, uh, what's the name of it? Oh, I can't remember. There, there's one, there's like a contemporary version of this, um, but it's basically doing philosophy as a form of therapy, like like talk therapy using the tools of philosophy, like debate and research and reading stuff and critically thinking as a, as a part of therapy. Not that it solves everything, but that it can be a tool in the tool belt. And there was, um, there's a couple of uh, people, uh, one person's named... Um, Victor Frankel, who I might have mentioned before, and then there's another dude, uh, R.D. Lang, um, who is a psychoanalyst from Britain in the mid-20th century, kind of famous too. Uh, both of those guys are called um, sometimes existential therapists or logotherapists. Um, there's, there's like a, a kind of tradition of using philosophical tools and, and existentialism in spe specifically in the, in the case of Victor Frankl to, to help with um, with therapeutic issues uh, and mental health. And I, I, I've seen it firsthand with myself and working with other people that sometimes those tools have something to offer too. So to completely dismiss it, I don't know if I would do that if for uh, like I would agree with Williams on that move. But certainly there are limits to it. And that um, rational tools are not always the right tool for the job. But this is, this is um, still Williams has a point here that this, this kind of scenario, while it um, is troubling just for the sake of compassion, like trying to, re the recognizing that there's a tragedy of how we can get into places where we're maybe less responsive to what could be good arguments or good reasons, that we lose maybe the bandwidth for being able to engage with that, that doesn't pose a threat to the in principle legitimacy of morality. It's just like this person's not, a, it's kind of like children. Children are freaking amoral animals, <laughs> in my opinion. I got one. Um, now, there's little little hints at something that maybe looks like empathy or compassion or respect or something like that. But, you know, they're really, children are developing the capacity to be responsive to moral matters. And they, they mature in this regard. Like, you increase your bandwidth and and tools and resources that you have. And I do think studying ethical theory is another way to extend your tools further and being able to participate with moral matters. But there is one person who is a threat, the genuine amoralist. Someone who's just like, I don't, I don't see the point. Uh, like a, a Williams puts it as a more defiant tone against the idea of moral oughts. Um, someone's like, that's bullshit. Nope. I don't see why I ought to do anything. The person who is experiencing despair or hopelessness, it's more of an expression of, of a defeat, of like, I just can't, I can't do, I can't engage with that. I just don't see it. I, not so much like, um, I don't think that's true, right? But maybe just like, I hope it's not true and I can't help not having hope for it. <laughs> Something more like that, right? It's a little different of a stance. Like, you can imagine the... The, this amoralist as maybe having full 
all the faculty like um, Hume talks about a person like this and his name for it is the sensible knave the person who's fully rational you know they got all the r rational toolkit um, resources and they're empowered in that way they're informed they don't have all these like biases going on um, but they when it comes to moral matters they're like I don't see any reason why I should give a shit about anybody else I don't see any ground for why there are some fences on my behavior, um, that there are obligations I have toward others. They're a knave, right, like a scoundrel. But they're rational. You know, Hume is like, is this person possible? Can you imagine a person who's fully rational and yet completely unresponsive to moral matters? If the moralist is right that there is moral truth and there's good reason for it, that there's a positive answer to that question, why be moral? Then that implies that the amoralist is doing something irrational, that they're either insensitive to moral reasons, for reasons for moral action that there, there is a rational basis for, or their reasoning about that is flawed, like making mistakes, just like how you might make a mistake in a math problem or a logic problem. There are, there are some flaw, moral philosophers out there, moral theories, that basically justify where the line is drawn on moral and immoral behavior by appeal to just pure logic itself. No other like emotional content or cultural standards or anything else, just pure logic ends up being the foundation. The principle of non-contradiction all by itself is maybe enough. Um, that's Kant, by the way. And when I teach Kant in my ethics classes, I always describe him as trying to squeeze blood from a stone. <laughs> You've got the stone of logic. And how are you supposed to get the like richness of a moral life that comes out of that? Um, and Kant definitely thinks he can. He think, thinks he can. And um, it's, just, it's a pretty good chance that maybe he succeeds on it. Um, but that, that's kind of a way to frame up Kant. But anyway, that's a whole other tangent, too. Um, the tricky part here for evaluating the amoralist as a threat to the moralist position, that they are an alternative, that there's like another way we could live. We don't have to be playing by the moral rules, so maybe we should do that instead of playing by moral rules or playing the moral game. What should we do about that? They, they do present an alternative. But before we can evaluate that alternative, we have to first understand just what that alternative is. So what does it mean to be the amoralist? And this is a fun discussion. This is why I gave you this reading, because I, I think it's kind of interesting. Um, to actually define them is somewhat difficult. And there's a lot of things that we might think are amoralists that are not amoralists. Um, yes, you did miss the code word, uh, Hudson. Uh, it was uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes ago I put it out there. Um, yeah, uh, and it's actually in the chat here, too. Um, so, yes, that's right, yeah. Um, so, okay. Um, I lost my train of thought, dang it. Uh, right, so to define who the amoralist is is important, and there's a lot of people that might we might think are amoralists that are actually not. They actually would be what we would call immoralists. So maybe the final thing I'm going to leave you with today is just this distinction. And then we'll go through how uh, Williams is defining the amoralist a little bit more tomorrow. But um, the difference between an amoralist and an immoralist is that the immoralist is playing the moral game. They make decisions based on what they believe is right and wrong and good and bad. But they just have the wrong idea of those things. So uh, example, I know it's a it's a meme, it's a cliche, but an example I'd give of an immoralist would be like Nazis, like Hitler. Hitler is an immoralist. As far as Hitler is concerned, he believes he's acting in a principled way. He's pursuing the good. Like the Nazis have an agenda of what they think is ideal for human existence. It is monstrous and completely against everything that I believe in as an ethicist. But it still is playing the moral game in that judgments of what is good and bad and right and wrong inform decision making. Okay? Even if those are faulty judgments, they're still how, the, how, how Hitler operates. The amoralist, in contrast, is just not even playing the moral game. They might even have beliefs that are correct about what is right and wrong and good and bad. They could identify it and be like, yep, that's unjust. But it doesn't factor into their decision making. 
It doesn't impress them. It doesn't cause them to change their behavior to do one thing versus something else. They never do things for reasons that are moral in their content, um, that are about moral phenomena, like things like what is just or unjust, as an example, um, or what's fair or equitable or something like that, or compassionate. The amoralist doesn't do that. The immoralist does, even if they have a faulty understanding of that. Um, and there could be a lot of, like, I don't think of Hitler as being an incredibly sincere person <laughs> in terms of, like, critically rethinking moral values or something like that. Maybe if he did, he might have, I don't know, figured out some things. But um, even, even with that, even if he holds those beliefs insincerely or unreflectively or uncritically, he still uses moral judgments that are moral in their character, just conceptually, as a part of informing decision making. So they are criticizable, they're still criticizable, but in a different way than for the amoralist. There's there's two different things going on. So what what was um, foreshadowing for where it goes from here? Williams thinks that a lot of cases of what we might imagine as an amoralist is really just someone who we just think has the wrong values. And people that think of themselves as being a moralist, of being like, I'm not playing the moral moralizing game, actually are. That it's actually really hard to be a genuine amoralist. So we'll talk about that more tomorrow. Um, I gotta let you go. Um, any questions here before I, I shut things down on the video? If you got any questions about this amoral immoral distinction, I would I'd be very much interested in answering that for you. You're welcome. That made sense, Bernadette? Cool, cool. You're welcome. See y'all later.